Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to host this on behalf of EMCC UK. My name is Natalia de Esteban. I'm the Knowledge Exchange Director, and I'm grateful to Peter and to Zoe for um, working with us in providing members and non-members with this fabulous resource, which is Climate and Coaching Series. And I welcome everybody. This is recorded. This will be made available. The slides will be made available. And if you have any questions or queries, please, as Peter's been saying, put it on your chat. We'll address them and enjoy the next hour. And I'll pass you over to Peter. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. And a big welcome to everyone who's joined and also to those who might uh, be calling in later and watching the recording. Um, Zoe and I hope you're all staying well and staying safe in your various places of isolation, but also staying making a difference. Um, can I ask that people all mute their mics and um, please put uh, questions in the chat box, and then I'll stop at least twice in the in in the uh, what, what we share. And Zoe is going to be watching all the questions coming in and she'll share what the questions are and who's asked them. And I might then invite you to open your mic so we can have a dialogue. It's great that you've all enjoyed. I'm about to share my, my screen. Um, you'll see my grandchildren before I get onto the slides very briefly. Um, and actually a, a quick glimpse of my grandchildren is perhaps important because as part of the work around um, how we deal with the ecological challenge, 10 years ago, I made a commitment that uh, I would use a picture of my grandchildren in every presentation I gave. And some of you I know have joined um, talks I've given for the MCC or other coaching bodies um, or the ones that uh, even I gave around COVID-19. And partly I always bring my grandchildren in because I think one of the things in all our coaching, to be really good coaches, we have to be aware of the generations that have come before us. And as the Native Americans say, be aware of the seven generations that precede you, the seven generations that come after you, and every living being that you share this moment in time with. And I think that's just such extraordinary visionary call. And so I always think it's important that at every meeting and in every coaching room, there should be a chair for, 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 for the ecology and for future generations. That we're moving at this time beyond coaching being great personal development for the already highly privileged, to being something that where we're partnering with our, our clients, we're partnering with our, our coaches, not treating them as the client, but as our partner and facing their stakeholder world. That we're moving from trying to be on, on the coaches agenda or our agenda to being on life's agenda. What is life asking us to work on? So now I start all my coaching and supervision by asking, you know, how is life knocking on your door? What, what, what are the issues that life is, is asking you to attend to? And um, what does that tell us about the work we need to do together? What is it we can do together that will be in service of your development, but even more importantly, of in service of all the people that your work and life serves? And if I just relate that to the COVID-19 briefly, you know, there's a lovely Chinese pictogram on, on the word crisis, which combines the two pictures of danger and opportunity. And certainly COVID-19 is an enormous danger for our health, for our businesses, uh, for, for how society responds. But it's also a massive opportunity. Uh, it's a massive opportunity because it, it's meant that we're all living in a, an intensive training and living in a VUCA world that's volatile and unpredictable, complex and ambiguous. We don't know whether we will get it or not. We don't know um, how we're going to have to adapt. We don't know how long it will go on. We're having to live with 
enormous amounts of uncertainty. It's breaking our usual routines and habits. At the same time, it's done um, had an enormous effect on the human species. It's been the best thing that's happened for the more than human world for the last 20 years. We're now seeing CO2 levels reducing to the level we need to get them back down to. We're seeing in Beijing and in Shanghai, and you can go on and see the maps on, on, on Google Earth, that the, the, we're seeing the cleanest air they've had for 20 to 30 years. I started doing um, sessions way back in January and early February for, for China, helping HR professionals and coaches there look at how do they work with their clients through, through the coronavirus. And, um, and what's been interesting following up is some of the teams who I was trying to teach about how to do virtual teaming have decided now the lockdown's ended in China to carry on doing virtual teaming at least two days a week and not doing the long commutes across Shanghai or Beijing or the other major cities. We're seeing the canals cleaner than they've been for 60 years in Venice. Um, I notice in my own garden, we're, we're seeing, we're hearing far more range of bird calls that we've heard for years. Um, so we have an opportunity, a, a really rich opportunity to, how do we use this, this time where, where our routine and our habits, the normal has been abolished, not just to take care of ourselves and our loved ones and our friends and, 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 our, and our clients, but to look at how do we use this as an opportunity to shift human consciousness. So at the end of this, we don't rush back to the old normal and try and reboot the, the, the massive destructive economy, but we discover in this time how to do the new normal when this crisis is over. And, and you also use it to, to, to grow our, 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 our individual team and collective capacity to, to deal with crises in a way that makes us more connected, not less connected. To deal with crises because this won't be the last crisis. You know, it's, it's from all the research, we know that the climate crisis is probably going to kill far more people than COVID-19. So how do we use this to prepare ourselves for, for what comes next? And uh, to move on to the, the ecology, um, I, I, if you haven't read it, I think Pope Francis's paper encyclical is not something I normally read, paper encyclicals, but his one, La Doughty C, about, about the, uh, the ecological crisis, was so beautifully written, where he says you know, there's such a strong scientific evidence that, that we are entering, we have already entered into the period of climate crisis, whether we're looking at sea temperatures, looking at earth temperatures, sea level rising, extinction of, of so many thousands of species, we are already in it. And, and Bruno Latour, who's a, a, a great plus I greatly admire, you know, he's pointing out that already the climate crisis is driving people crazy. Um, and, and that actually we are dealing with what, what the British Psychological Society now call eco-anxiety. Whether we're, we're suffering from it consciously or unconsciously, it's in every room. So I've done quite a lot of talks to Zoe, you know, perhaps not as many as Zoe, but a lot of talks to, to coaches around the, the ecology crisis over the last several years. And, and I still meet coaches who say to me or write me emails and say, oh, but it's not our job to bring the ecology into the coaching room. And I, you know, I, I get uh, less and less patience. So to, to one group, I said, do your clients not eat or breathe? Because if they eat and breathe, then the ecology is already in the room. It's just that you're not paying attention to it. Yeah? And, and, and how do we recognize that the ecology is not out there or separate from us? The ecology and us are inextricably entwined. We only survive as part of it, and it, whatever we name it, Nature, the environment, ecology lives inside every cell of our being. There is no separation. 
Um, and, and Professor Susan Greenfield is probably one of the top researchers in the world on, on neuroscience, has pointed out it, it is um, permeating everyone's mindset and it is changing the way our brains operate. Um, so uh, with Zoe and with our colleagues at uh, the, uh, the Climate Coaching Alliance, and I know quite a few of you online joined the, uh, what I describe as a 24 hour webathon that we had on March the 5th. Um, we, we developed this model about how can we move through these stages? And it's the feedback I got, we shouldn't make it linear. It's, it's a, a cycle because we keep going around this in, in deepening and deepening spirals. But how do we move from being eco-curious, making sure that, that, that we awaken our interest in, in, in what's happening rather than being in denial? How do we become eco-informed and know what's going on? Be really informed about the changes that are happening in the world. How do we become eco-aware? That is dealing with our own emotionality and what it brings up for us, our own denial, distress, grief, anxiety, guilt, shame. How do we move to being eco-engaged, which is the stage where we developed our own skills about how to work with our, with our coaches, with our teams, with our organizations, in a way that makes this present in every meeting and every coaching room. And then the final bit of the cycle before we have to go back round again, how do we become eco-active, not just trying to change what we do in, in the hours we're coaching, but how do we use our influence beyond the coaching room? How do we, you know, I've started to, like many of us, to look at my whole supply chain, places where I run trainings, people who, who, who run my pension, my accountant, all my suppliers, and looking at making sure, you know, I've talked, I insisted on meeting with the, um, the person who's the chief investor of the people who run my pension scheme, right? Because I believe we've got more power to influence change through our pension funds than we do through our vote. And, and most of us are not using it. So how do, we, how do we look at all our partners? How do we put something on our website? How do we start to move beyond what we're doing in the coaching room? So just to give you, th these are the five levels. Eco-curious, David is discovering more eco-informed, looking at the science, looking at what's happening, looking out across the world, becoming globally eco-literate. Eco-aware, dealing with the emotionality. Eco-engaged, using it in our direct work. Eco-active, go beyond our direct work. And, you know, this is um, Zoe way back over a year ago said, you know, where were all the coaches when the planet warmed by three degrees? It was an echo what I asked people in EMCC, I think in 2009, about where were all the coaches where the banks were burning? You know, how do we take a step up to a bigger responsibility and a bigger way of using our influence. And, and you know, we're currently on course for over three degrees warming. And, you know, let's be clear that three de degrees warming is pretty frightening. It will lead to massive biodiversity, loss of extinction of species. It will lead to the permafrost releasing large amount of methane in lots of cycles. And I know probably Zoe talked about a lot of this on the, on the first webinar. Uh, sorry, Zoe, I was unable to attend. It will lead to many cities going underwater, increased cyclones, flooding, uh, climate weirding events, mass migration. Um, we've talked uh, all, all, all the, the, the um, webinars that, that uh, even I've been doing uh, about Earth Overshoot Day. We are using currently 1.7 times renewable Earth's resources every year. So we are living on borrowed time and, and, and mortgaging the future for our current needs. We are leaving each generation a less resource world. Uh, the, the, the day and the year when we've used all of the renewable resources 
1999 was the 29th of September, and, and now it's the 29th of July last year, and it's coming even further forward. And you can go onto the website, um, and, and you can look, just put on Earth Overshoot Day, and you can look at it country by country, right? Because it, it, if everyone was doing what the UK is doing, it would be much earlier than the 29th of July. And, and this is, this is the, we'll make these slides available. This will give you all, the, all of it by country. So, so that's our challenge. Before I go on to, well, what can we do about each of those stages? Let, let's see what questions have come in. So Zoe, if you open your mic. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, just, just a couple of questions starting to come in. So um, Heather's uh, just commenting and reflecting that COP26 is now being delayed, which is came out yesterday, didn't it? It was announced yesterday, probably till May next year. Um, and then... Board. No, no, I, I, I think there's mixed views about it. But yeah, exactly. It's... Um, to, from my perspective, quite a lot of activism movements weren't exactly uh, hopeful about what COP would deliver anyway. So I think there's a lot of conversations outside COP, but you know that's probably another conversation in its own right. But yeah, it, and, it's... And, it, and it might be that, that what we urgently need, and there's not a lot of out there, is people who are connecting what we need to do in COP with what's happening around COVID. You know, there, there is... Yeah. There, so, so any references people have got of things they've read, which are connecting the two, do, uh, do put them in the chat box, and we'll we'll save the chat box so that that those links can be made available. Yeah, good. That's a good point. There's some there's there are some really good conversations, posts, articles, and um, YouTube videos at the moment that I'm looking at that have com connecting all the dots on a global level. Um, so we've got a few points coming up in the chat, Peter. We've got. Um, uh how might we practically bring the ecology into one-to-one -one and team coaching uh yeah. when we're holding the client's agenda which may not even include ecology i think that's a, that's from moses that's a real classic thing that it kind of comes up every time and um be uh, interesting to definitely bring that in because i think every every coach comes to that question at some point or other um We've got a point about uh, that data appears not to be enough to support individual behavior change and collective action, that's, that's for sure. Um, what are the parameters that would enable behavior change despite the consequences of climate change not being perceived as immediate for many people? That's the sort of million dollar question, isn't it? Um, Great. How, uh, so, 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 do you want to take a couple of those and then I'll keep looking at the questions? Yeah, it'd be great to have people's names. So. Um, um, let me just also pick up on Pauline's and look at the chats. Um, and Pauline, do open your mic. The, the opportunity we have in the current crisis. Well, well, this is something that that um, we did these three webinars for coaches around the world with Eve Turner and myself. And, and one of them is how do you get alongside your client in different ways? So there are a lot of people who are volunteering to do um, pro bono coaching for frontline NHS staff. There are a lot of people like um, a colleague of mine who I supervise in Mexico, who's, who's got a whole group of coaches who are pro bono supporting struggling small businesses on their creativity of staying alive and seeing how many businesses they can keep afloat. Um, there is one of the things that, that I think we could all be doing at the moment is I've been having lots of my client organizations do effective virtual teaming. I, um, and even I've written some stuff about that. So now how do they keep alignment, they keep morale, they keep productivity in their team by the way they do daily check-ins, by the way they have, I've got one team I was working with um, that, that every, every Friday they end the week together as well. And they do it in, in fun ways where they, that they have a party, a virtual party and um, um, it, it, it's a company in Portugal. They told me yesterday that, uh, very proudly, that they had done, um, let's end the week with all dressing up and, and having tea with the Queen, <laughs> which is unusual from a Portuguese company. But so you can imagine all these people around different parts of Lisbon all, all being very English and having, ending the week dressed up with tea with the Queen and wearing crowns. Um, so I think there's a lot. 
a lot we can do. There's a lot we can do in the short term. Yeah, Zoe. Sorry, I'm just reading the chat, reflecting on what's coming in in the chat. I'm, I'm sort of sensing a real thirst for us to move into um, uh, talking about about practicalities, but not necessarily in a in a kind of very nuts and boltsy sense, uh, but actually beyond that, in terms of how yeah. do we have bigger conversations with our clients in different sectors and really help the thinking and rethinking about how we move on as uh, on a you know global level really i think i'm seeing some really great. big big picture stuff great Let, so let's do that and 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 i'll and I'll, I'll springboard off moses um uh, question um, how can we bring the ecology very practically to one-to-one -one team coaching engagements when we're holding the client's agenda which may not even include ecology and that's also true for one-to-one. -one. So I'm going to quite quickly go through, um, and, and we'll make these available. Oh, this has gone strange on me. So I'll close this down the chat box. This is something about once we've got through, I've talked a bit about how do we get ourselves eco-curious uh, and eco-informed, then eco-aware. I think the first step we have to do in order to be able to coach practically around, and, and, and bring in the ecology is to work through our own emotional process and to get help doing that whether it's from our, our coach supervisor whether it's from a peer group but really to look at what's our all inner process in response to climate crisis and how do we keep getting caught in some of these stages denial when we really wake up to it and what what we as a human species have done inevitably there are there are stages of grief pain and trauma then we can get into real anger and blame. We can, we can find people who we see as the culprits, you know, whether it's politicians or the, the oil companies. Yeah, we can go into anger and blame of others and fury about it. But then we can start to see that, well, actually, you know, the money that's perhaps out there investing in the companies that are creating some of the problems is also our pension scheme. And then we start to realize, oh my God, I'm part of this. You know, people talk about, I, it really annoys me when I hear Boris Johnson and others talk about, well, look at what we're doing, we're ahead of the field. Because the CO2 emissions are up there for 200, 300 years. And if you look historically, the UK has contributed more CO2 into the atmosphere per head of the population than any country in the world, because we started first. And when you wake up to that, you then get into guilt and shame. And then there's something about how do we keep working through that, the stage where we can take our, our share of responsibility, that, that this is something we are all responsible for. We can't blame our ancestors, we can't blame the politicians, the oil companies. We are all part of how we created this. And then how do we move that into to, to where a lot of the questions are? You know, how do we move that into action? And then how do we move that beyond what we can do individually in our own work to what we can do collectively? So um, I've written a lot about that cycle with my wife in this book on intuitive psychotherapy. Um, again, we could probably make that available. But I think it means we've also, this question that Moses has asked, it means we need to start our coaching differently. If we don't get the ecology into the room in the very first meeting, in the very first contracting, it will become harder and harder to bring it in. And I start my coaching, you know, for many years. And like David Clutterbuck, you know, I, I've been in the coaching industry almost since it started in the UK, if not when it started. We always used to ask, you know, what do you want from coaching? What are your goals? The grow model was popular, you know, way back in the 70s, 80s. And these are 20th century ways of starting coaching, as far as I'm concerned. Now I say to, to whoever it is, so I'd say to uh, Natalia, you know, tell me about you. Tell me about what you care about. What, what, what are you passionate about? What really matters to you in your life? I say the same to teams. I say, you know, tell me about this team and what's this team passionate about? But the third question is a critical one. Tell me about who and what your work and life serves. Who are all the stakeholders in your life? Your family, your colleagues, the team you lead. Well, who, who are the stakeholders of the team? The other teams in the organization? 
the internal and external customers. And I have a stakeholder map that I use when I've chaired companies, which says that, that there are at least six stakeholder groups we, we cannot afford to ignore. Employees, they must have a seat in every coaching room. Customers, investors, partner organizations and suppliers. The communities where we operate, the human communities, the communities right around the world where we operate, and the more than human world or the ecology. Because if we are not co-creating value with and for them, we're not creating a sustainable business. And so I will work with my individual client or the team to help them keep expanding by asking them and who's beyond that stakeholder. And the more we've got all the stakeholders into the room, I'll say, so if they were all here, we were asking them, what is the work they need us to do together in our individual coaching or in our team coaching? that we can co-create greater beneficial value with and for them, what would they be saying? I might even have an individual client go and sit in all those chairs. And then I'll ask, well, who, who's the petty fairy? Who, who's, the, who's the stakeholder we're ignoring at our peril who will come uh, and surprise us in the next two years and will regret not having attended to today? Yeah, many governments, for instance, at the moment, they say, well, we could have predicted COVID-19, but actually all the, all the data was out there that we were going to face a global pandemic, right? And some countries had done all sorts of rehearsals for this and some hadn't. Some had reserved stockpiles for this and some didn't, right? We didn't know exactly how it was going to arrive, but we knew we were going to get a pandemic that would spread very fast across the world and that we didn't have the vaccine for. That was known. Bill Gates had been talking about it for five years. So this is an opportunity to say, so, so what's the next crisis that's going to take us unprepared and we're going to regret not being prepared for? So what I'm really encouraging all coaches and, and, and um, team coaches and organizational consultants to do is, is ask questions that are future back and outside in. Yeah? It took me another, another 10 years to um, change my indie way of ending sessions. I used to ask what's been helpful about the session and what could be more helpful next time. And I thought I was asking for feedback, but, but I realized after 20 years, I wasn't. I was asking for reassurance because people would say, oh, it's all been great. Yes, yeah, just more of the same. And, and, and this was, this was a creating a... Uh, 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 an egocentricity for two between me and the client. Now I ask if we bring those, those client voices back in, those stakeholder voices, you know, your wife, your, your team, your customers, your boss, what, what would they, the, the apology, what would they have valued about the work you and I have done together? So, and what, what would their challenge be to us? Including the ecology. Yeah, and, and that way, it's not that I'm bringing the ecology in. The ecology is already there. I am just wakening and opening the room up. The great, the great poet, uh, Jaladin Rumi said, why in the plentitude of God's universe have you chosen to fall asleep in such a small, dark prison? And he could be saying that to every coaching dyad. Why in the plentitude of God's universe, God being however you conceive of it, you know, the oneness of life, why in the oneness of life have you chosen to do your coaching in such a small dark prison, metaphorically? And how do we as coaches start to open the windows, unpick the prison locks, open up a bigger room within the coaching room? And what I realized is by ending by saying what's helpful and what's not helpful, it was a really arrogant way of that I was ending my sessions. Because I was pretending I had done the coaching. And, and that not that actually we'd done the coaching, and actually it wasn't just the coaching and I had done the coaching. The most important bit of the coaching work had been done by then, myself, but 
the agenda that life was setting us. Life had done the, the biggest third of the work. They'd done the second biggest third, and I had done the smallest third as the coach. And yet, arrogantly, I was stepping back in to be the supplier who supplied the coaching. Yeah, which I think is very arrogant. And Zoe's got her question, a hand up. <laughs> it's more, it's more a, refle a reflection, um, kind of picking up on what you're sharing, Peter, and also reflecting on some of the points in the chat um, uh, and the context that for me, I think that this, the pandemic crisis is showing us that many of the changes that uh, politically or publicly were deemed not possible or not acceptable are actually entirely possible in the face of a different type of crisis, which is deemed to be a crisis. Um, so uh, for me, I guess it's, we're in a moment where we can have different conversations and be show up differently, perhaps be braver, et cetera, than we would have been because, you know, why the hell not, basically. Um, and, and the things I think, an unimaginable thing, things are happening that are unimaginable even only three months ago. So I guess how, how does this, this shift in context and moment kind of reflect itself in what you're saying, Peter? Because um, having had the, the joy of working with you on and off over a number of years, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm hearing that the wisdom that you've learned over that period. And I'm kind of curious about actually in the here and now of this moment, how can that be, you know, even braver, even more courageous, even more transformational? So, so let me pick up on that. And, and Jeff and others who ask questions about what we could do as a profession, we will come on to when we talk about eco-activism as opposed to eco-engagement. So I'll come back to that bit of it, what we could do collectively. But, but the, what can we do at this particular time you know, it, it's very interesting. I, I've supervised so many coaches in the, in the last month um, that I'm, I'm suffering Zoomitis as opposed to COVIDitis. And many are reporting to me that what's happened is when people are first hit by the crisis, their, their client organizations, that they immediately, having worked with you in partnership, suddenly turn you back into supplier and say, oh, anything that's not essential, we have to stop doing so. We can't do coaching any longer. And, and the people who've been really successful that I supervise have actually got to closer partnership with their client organizations through this period. I've been able to say to their partners, as soon as they start to push them back into supplier box, now actually it's, it's even more important the work we do together in this period. This is an opportunity you and I can't afford to miss. And, and I think we have to be, first of all, brave to have that conversation, which is to see our clients as partners and to contract with them that we're not a supplier. That, that's part of my kind of, and they're not a customer. Because that's the only thing, that, as things get tough, hold us in relationship. And you're only a partner. I, I read a blog. It's on my um, uh, LinkedIn site, if you, if you linked in with me. Um, you can find it a couple of years ago, which said partnerships are not created by partners. You don't create a partnership with, your, with, with a, a, a team a coaching client or an individual coachee by saying, let's be partners. You only become, it's the purpose that creates the partnership, not the partners. By bringing in life's agenda and the stakeholders, where we're shoulder to shoulder both facing it, that's what builds the partnership. And, and just a little aside, I, I wrote that blog just over two years ago, just before my 40th wedding anniversary. And uh, that wasn't um, irrelevant because I, in, in, in the article, I talk about marriages, mergers, and um, um, executive teams, right? And, and how I, I used to spend years trying to help them develop missions and visions. And I realized that's a very eclectic, egocentric thing to do rather than help them discover purpose. What is it we can do together we cannot do apart? First question for every partnership. And so I think it's really important as coaches we learn how to build a straight of, of triangulated partnership with every team, every organization, every individual. And that is because we have, not that we, because we love each other or like each other, 
but because together we've got important work to do that they can't do without us and we can't do without them. We're on life's agenda helping them with that. And that I think is what, what keeps us in relationship when we hit these periods. Um, so I wanted to kind of really get passionate from moments about that, um, which I hope is helpful. And, and we'll come back to that. But let me just come on to um, some other practical things that, that, that Eve Turner and I wrote in our book on systemic coaching, where we did a whole chapter and looked at what different coaches were doing, um, both in the UK and abroad. Um, I've talked about number one at length. How do we, you know, for those who arrived late, I was just sharing that, that one of the things I committed to at the beginning of COVID-7, spending so much time on, on, on Zoom, um, was that I would always have fresh flowers or a plant behind me. Um, so that we are, and I, by the way, there's a little, there's a prize for anyone who, who has worked out what the flowers are before the end of the, the webinar. So keep your answers coming in. Um, and I've been changing them so that, that you know, there are ways of bringing the, the, the wider, more than human world and make, making it present in the room. Some people do it through objects, stones, um, what pictures you use, how you use the view from your window, right? Wherever you're coaching, whether that's the top of a, a, a canary wharf tower block or whether it's from your home. How do you allow people to pause and say, so what do you notice as you look out the window? How do we let that wider view in? Um, how do you use flowers, drawing materials, representations? A lot of work we talk about, and we give some examples in the book of, of coaching outdoors, walking with the client, but not, you know, walking helps us attune and get into the same rhythm and be shoulder to shoulder. But one of the things when people come here and do um, coaching retreats, I, I run some advanced coaching retreats for people, is I get them to walk through our woodland, um, which uh, we, we planted about 20 years ago, um, which is now really tall. And, and, and to, as they do the circuit through the woodland, to allow the ecology, not as a challenge, but also as a resource, and I give them the challenge, how do they use the trees? How do they use the birds? How do they use what's around them, the path? And get the ecology to do the coaching, not just them or the coaching. And this really it starts to kind of shift mindsets because now the more than human world isn't just a challenge we're landing on the agenda. It's part of doing the work and being the work. And then other people uh, who we give examples of uh, are using uh, horses, they're using dogs, they, they're using um, um, uh, equine therapy, equine coaching. And, and then also we're looking at how coaches can share, having done their own work with the ecological awareness model, how can they appropriately share that? So they're not coming from a place of knowing better or knowing first, but being alongside. So that, those are some of the surfacing strategies. And, and, and the, other, the other thing that many of you may have met from me before is this concept of white angled empathy, right? We are so trained as coaches to have really listened deeply and to listen with our whole bodies, to listen with our hearts, not just with our cognitive ears, that we develop enormous empathy for the person in the room with us. And in fact, you know, that could go so far that, that we could go into vicarious trauma if we're dealing with people who've been traumatized because we start to breathe with them. We start to see the world through their eyes. Our body takes up their, their, their rhythm. Our, our body starts to go into limbic resonance. And, and we've been teaching quite a lot. I teach on the retreats as well around how, how do you notice vicarious trauma in yourself and how do you attend to it? But the problem also is that as we go into deep empathy, we see the world through our client's eyes. We hear their story, not his story, but his reality. And we hear about all these awful people like toxic leaders and impossible colleagues. And, 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 and we see them as persecutor, our coach is victim and us as rescuer. 
So I think the next stage for coach training for all of us is how do we have wide angled empathy, which means having as much empathy and compassion for everyone in the story, not just every human individual, but every organization, every system, every country, and the wider ecosystem as we do for the individual. How do we have compassion and not judgment? And, and I, I really have encouraged for several years all my people who train with me to practice this watching the news. Set a stopwatch on your, on your, your mobile phone and see how many seconds and minutes you can watch the news, having compassion not just for the health workers, but for the, 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 the people at the ministry, not just for the, um, the victims of bombing, but, the, but, but the, the, the people who are doing the bombing. It is such a tough training. If any of you get beyond five minutes, 20 seconds, which has been my record, please send me an email and tell me what mindfulness practice you're doing, because I'd love to learn from you. It is tough work. Yeah, that, that wide angled empathy and compassion, which I think we all need to develop. And, and without that, and by wide angled, that means we have to get beyond individual um, focus of we've got to be from IQ to WeQ and from WeQ to global WeQ and from global WeQ to the more than human WeQ to move from ecocentricity to ecocentricity and that's what we, we're happy to do all the time so before I go on and just say five minutes around being ecoactive and what we can do as a as, as, um, as a profession are there any more kind of very specific questions anyone who would like to open their mic um, let, let's allow people to open their mics and, and would like to come back about specific things you can do in your work with, with clients around eco-engagement. Let me come stop sharing for a moment the, the slide so I can see more people. Has anyone got their hand up or is waving? You could also put your hand up on the participants if you'd like to open your mic or just open it and come back at me. The two people speak at once. I'll uh, I'll manage that as well. Um, Peter, Jaffra, hi. Jaffa, not Jaffra. Um, oh, sorry. My I yes. must put my better glasses on. Yes. Jaffa, sorry, I can read it now. Um, I, there is the. Um, I was talking to somebody today, and uh, just before we came on, and we talked about America is using three billion a uh, three um trillion dollars on combating um this this virus for americans whereas if you're in bangladesh or in sub-sahara africa there is no way you could do even the smallest of the fraction of that so i think i think the model is great but it's very much individualistic i think um there is something about impacting on the global inequalities that exist. And, um, um, and I think that is really something that we as coaches really don't look at. We don't look at inequality, we don't look at inclusion. Um, all our models are primarily self, uh, human centered and, and client centered, which is great. And I'm all with that, but we somehow in that window to the rest of the world, we need to cut, we need to look at the inequalities and, I agree. And, and, and lack of inclusion that we have we play a part in that by not acknowledging, by not impacting on, you know, passively we're contributing to that as coaches. I, 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 I couldn't agree more. And thank you, thank you so much, Jaffa, for raising that. There is no way we we can in any way address climate crisis without addressing global social inequality and inclusion you know there's a story I, I, I've used in, in one of the, the books of the, many of the um, third world countries coming to the original President Bush at the Rio summit in 1992 saying look it's, it's unfair that you are expecting us to have the same carbon reduction as, as, as you are um, because, you know, A, we don't have the resources to, to adjust as quickly as you, and B, 
a lot of what we're doing is producing goods to support the American way of life. And the President Bush's response is, was the American way of life is not up for negotiation. And I think that story to me just somehow captures how the two things are inextricably linked. That if we, if we can't face how our privilege has a price for other parts of the human world, we are not gonna face how our privilege also has a price for the more than human world. Um, my, my, my wife, Judy Ride's written um, um, a book last year called um, White Privilege Unmasked, which is all about how do we face up to, to how we are still living off white privilege. Um, uh, and, and by white, she defines it as the kind of European diaspora. Um, and, and if we can't face up to that, you know, if, if we're not willing to, it, for me, the two things are inextricably linked and parallel. So, so thank you for raising that. And, and just to say, I, I, I started with an individualistic um, approach because of, of the group I'm talking to, but I hopefully what's coming across, this is a systemic approach. And part of that is that, is thinking about nested systems. I don't believe there is such thing as individual coaching any longer because it's not just the individual who turns up in, in the coaching room. Their family system, their team dynamic, their organizational culture, their, their human, their, their collective um, uh, uh, ethnic culture, um, the ecology all turn up inside them. So, so my view now is that, the, the, you know, if we're going doing individual coaching, we're not doing individual coaching. We are doing systemic coaching, which is coaching the systemic, the system in and through the individual. That makes sense. We should come on. Are there any other questions, Zoe, that you'll see that are really important? If you can name who it is, that would be also helpful. And then I'll just say a bit more about ecoactivism while we still got time. Um, just got a question. Uh a question that's just come up from uh, Sam. Um, interested to know the definition of inclusivity um, and how we can promote that with clients. Promote what with clients? I lost In your, your, inclu your voice. Inclusivity. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's sort of, for me, there's something kind of threading through this, which brings it for me back about courage and bravery that, there's there's so much fear and anxiety in the system everywhere understandably right now and it's kind of echoing it systemically um for me there's there's a time that you know there's never been a better moment to be as our our, our bravest most courageous selves really but so that kind of echoes with that yeah i wonder i wonder zoe what's coming up if i kind of link what what jaffa said what sam's saying and what i was saying earlier that actually there are many, many, what you're saying about courage and bravery, there, there are very many. What, what one is, how do we start every, every coaching relationship, whether it's individual team, organizational, um, governments or whatever, with bringing the wider system into the, the room, bringing in empty chairs, bringing, bringing it in an embodied way, get, getting multi-stakeholder contract. But the next level, I think, of courage and bravery is to challenge what are the stakeholders we're not even noticing? Both human, which I think speaks to the inclusion of diversity, and, and the more than human. What, 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 what is our, our blinkers, our, our culture stopping us seeing and, and noticing? Yeah. How, how, come, you know, how come we're more worried about, you know, we, at the moment, we've stopped even noticing that there are thousands dying in East Africa from from the um, from the uh, the uh, the, uh, the plague that's going on there. Yeah, um, because you know we screen out that which isn't immediate and and close to us. Sorry, Jaffa, you wanted to come back in, I think. Yes, uh, I, I mean inclusivity is such a big subject. It's very difficult to say how you do it. Um, um, I think you need to be before you actually do um, inclu inclusion. 
I agree. Right? So it operates at the level of conscious and at the level of unconscious. Yep. So it's quite big. And however, I think just as a, as a key to that, to that door, um, to that room, we can ask ourselves in everything we do, what are the assumptions I'm making here? And where do they come from? And who is included in this assumption? Who isn't included in this assumption? Yeah. Because it's about our backstory that comes into the room, which is influenced with various um, um, factors, various you know, um, systems that, we, that we've been part of, various cultures that we've been part of. So that brings a degree of awareness. You know, what, what, when, I'm, when I'm making assumptions, where do they come from? What are they based on? Um, who is not included in that? Who is included in that? Because my guess is when we make our assumptions, it's probably uh, made based on people like ourselves, people who look like us, yeah, who feel like us, who behave like us, who live like us, who have, you know, who are in immediate vicinity of, um, uh, you know, um, um, where, where, where we are in the world. So that might help as a way in, but it's, it's, yes. it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a life's work. It's not something you can do and leave, you know, leave behind, say, I've done it. You have to be first. You have to breathe it. You have Absolutely. to live it. And I, and I think that's such at the core of, of, of all coaching supervision work or coaching work is <clears throat> how are we working on, on, on our cultured, blinkered, assumptions how are we helping our clients do that but how are we also noticing the ones that that we are co-sharing with our coaches yeah and and how do we have that reflective capacity but it, almost that's a whole kind of another much longer webinar on its own right but but i'm i'm totally in agreement with you jeff i think this is such at the heart of that and, 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 and that's at the heart of whether we're talking about COVID-19, inclusion and diversity, or the ecology, and I think all three are interconnected. Well, I do want to just use the last few minutes just to say a couple of things about what, you know, what we can do beyond the coaching room. What, one is I would really encourage you all to go on to climatecoachingalliance.org. There's some nice comments on, online I noticed earlier on. Sorry, I've, I've forgotten your names. But, but how we can learn from other organizations. So this was set up last year. Um, I have to say for people who say, can we get all the coaching bodies to work together on this? It was really um, heartwarming that um, all the major coaching bodies, ICF, EMCC, APEX, AC, British Psychological Society, um, from many parts of the world, joined that initial call. And there is a lot going on to try and get all the coaching bodies working together on this. Um, and Climate Coaching Alliance is working right across all of them. So do join that. But there's one other thing I would really encourage you to do to keep updating. And, and that is, you know, something I know Zoe has done, um, I've done, uh, uh, others who are in this Climate Coaching Alliance, is, is to put something on your website about what is your climate emergency policy and commitments. You might call it your sustainability policy, but how do you update that to being a climate emergency? And what are you doing in terms of, of, of making a difference, not only in your work or beyond it? Because that's also a way that will open up new conversations. Yeah, but I think it is important that, that, that we're starting with our own, our own work. Um, and then just to say, which I think echoes what Jaffa was saying, helpfully at the heart of the coming environmental revolution this is from james hillman who was a great teacher of mine um he was head of the young institute in zurich before he set off archetypal psychology at the heart of the coming environmental revolution is a crisis in value one that derives from growing appreciation of our dependence on nature without that there is no hope in simple terms we cannot restore our own health thinking of this current time our own sense of well-being, thinking about this current time, unless we restore the health of the planet. And we can't restore the health of the planet unless we discover new forms of collaboration, inclusion, and diversity across the human species. And then just to come back to, to the DART AC, 
many things have to change, of course, but it is we human beings above all who need to change. We lack an awareness of our common origin, of our mutual belonging, and of a future to be shared with everyone. The basic awareness would enable the development of new convictions, attitudes, and forms of life. A great cultural, spiritual, and educational challenge stands before us, and it would demand that we set out on the long path of renewal. I think because we're so privileged as coaches in terms of our education, in terms of our emotional education, as well as our cognitive, that, that with that privilege comes responsibility. We're also privileged in terms of, of having far more influence and far more connectivity than we probably even realize. That privilege brings the responsibility of how are we using that influence? What are we doing that can increase that impact and that influence fivefold? Because I think we all can. And, and that, that, that word of hope, all is not lost. Human beings, and we've seen this really writ large the last few days, while capable of the worst, are also capable of rising above themselves, choosing again what is good and making a new start, despite their mental and social conditioning. Discovering the prison of our attitudes and assumptions and finding ways to liberate ourselves from those. One last question, Zoe, that, that, that's come in, and then we're going to have to finish, but, but do join me on LinkedIn. If you've got other questions, what we'll try and do is we'll, we'll try and save the, the chat box and make that available as well. And, and I'll try and respond to some of the questions that we haven't addressed while we've been online. Thanks, Peter. You can put one last question. Yeah. Um, there's a few people needing to go, which I understand, but um, uh, a Thank question you. from Nic Nicola who has needed to go, but nonetheless, it's quite an interesting question about, about the sort of theme of going back to normal, inverted commas, which uh, I'm sure many of us are dearly hoping that the world doesn't actually do because normal, as Naomi Klein says, normal is a crisis. Um, and uh, she's talking about virt working virtually and the benefit of doing that and actually worrying that people will go back to traveling, et cetera. But what can we do to encourage our clients to, to stay with the new and the different and, and the different ways of working? Yeah, I, I can't emphasize enough. I think it's, it's seizing this opportunity mm. to help them connect even deeper virtually yeah. and learn the skills of that. There's an ebook that's just come out that even I contributed to about. Um, I'll try and put the reference, um, get uh, the, the Tyler's put it up on the MCC website, which is all about it, it was written in about a week, um, all about li living with COVID 19 and what we could use this time for. And we just put a, a very short 500 words about, about virtual teaming effectively. If we can get them to actually realize that they could be even more effective as a team working virtually they're not going to rush back to face to face. <laughs> we can use this opportunity to run really fantastic virtual conferences. Mm. People aren't going to be flying around the world, you know, having these massive jamborees, which have enormous uh, uh, um, input. And, and, I, and I know EMCC are, 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 are working with another organization I'm connected with to look at how they can, can run a, a, a really virtually vibrant um, EMCC conference. And, and I think we need to grab this opportunity to learn now so that people don't rush back to the old normal. And, and I just want to say thank you for joining. Thank you for the differences you, you're all making. Thank you. thank you for your questions. And I'm sorry we didn't have time for more of them. <laughs> thank but, you, Peter. But, but thank you, you know, thank you for the, not just the difference you are doing, but the, the even bigger difference you're going to be doing in the future. Go well, stay safe. Spread your influence. <laughs> thank you, Peter, and thank you, Zoe. Um, it's been a great pleasure to have you today. I have posted um, the website for this recording and the slides and the bookings for the next uh, webinars in the series. Just bear with us a day or two while we upload all of this. And again, many, many thanks to all of you for joining and Peter and Zoe for the time, generosity, and expertise. On behalf of the MCC, it's been a pleasure. Stay safe, everybody. Sorry, you wanted to.